Uh, G9A, antenna feed lines, characteristic impedance and attenuation, SWR calculation, measurements and effects, and matching networks. Which of the following factors determine the characteristic impedance of a parallel conductor antenna feed line? Let's take a look at what a parallel conductor antenna feed line is. And that's this kind of a feed line. It can be an open line like this with spacers between, or it can be the ribbon type like this with a plastic dielectric in between the parallel conductors. And what determines the characteristic impedance is the distance between the centers of the conductors and the radius of the conductors. And if you know those things, there actually is a formula you can use to calculate what the characteristic impedance of that feed line will be. The distance between the centers and the radius of the conductors. What are the typical characteristic impedances of coaxial cables used for antenna feed lines at amateur stations? Uh, most amateur stations use 50 and 75 ohm uh, coaxial cables. 50 and 75 ohm coaxial cables. Here's a diagram of a coaxial cable, in case you're not familiar with it. It has a copper wire, either a solid one or a braided one, in the center. It has insulation. It has a copper mesh. Uh, shield around it. Sometimes there's aluminum foil here between the insulation and the mesh, and then it has an outer insulation. But uh, the key of the, to this question is that the characteristic impedances for the ones used in amateur stations are 50 and 75 ohm uh, coaxial cables. What is the characteristic impedance of flat ribbon TV type twin lead? That's once again this kind here. And the characteristic impedance of that is 300 ohms. What's the reason for the occurrence of reflected power at the point where a feed line connects to an antenna? The reason for the reflected power is a difference between feed line impedance and antenna feed point impedance. And I have a neat little graphic here, which I hope runs properly, so you can see that. Here we have a 50 ohm coaxial cable. Here we have a signal that's being, putting, being put through that. And at this point, it encounters a 200 ohm antenna. So we have an, a, an, an impedance mismatch here, don't we? We have 500 ohm coaxial cable attempting to feed a 200 ohm antenna. And when that happens, some of the power goes forward, but a significant portion of it is reflected back down that feed line, back toward the transmitter. Okay. Now, this is just showing a single pulse. It's a neat an animation. I really like it, and it shows it better than anything I could draw. But it, uh, uh, it shows that the reason for that reflected power is this change in the impedance here at the antenna. Okay. One other way you can think of this why you get reflected power. If you stand at a window and you try to look outside at night holding a flashlight, you'll shine the flashlight out in the yard and you'll see what's out in the yard maybe, but the main thing you're going to see is the flashlight because you have a, like, an impedance discontinuity with the glass. So the glass in the window is going to do the same thing as this mismatch right here. It's going to cause reflected power to come back toward the flashlight uh, because of that mismatch. If the window is open, the glass isn't in the way, then you don't have that. It's a continuous impedance all the way out, no reflection. How does the attenuation of coaxial cable change as the frequency of the signal it's carrying increases. Uh, the attenuation or the loss of strength in the coaxial uh, in, in the signal changes as a, as a, uh, uh, a function of the frequency. Uh, it, it, the attenuation is higher as the frequency goes up. So as the frequency increases, the attenuation increases. Okay? And here is a here is a chart that shows several characteristic cables. I hope you can see this okay. And it shows this is a very small cable, um, smaller, smaller, than a, smaller than a pencil, about half, maybe a third of the size of a pencil. 
And you can see here that even at one megahertz, it has significant loss. Uh, uh, this, is, this is decibels of loss per 100 feet. Uh, and these are the smaller cables here. The bigger cables have less loss. And especially when you get to like 100 megahertz, uh, except for a very short run, this is like you would have on the inside of a radio, maybe from point to point on a circuit board. This is a prohibitive amount of loss here. But if you come up here to the uh, uh, RG213, here we only have 2.2 dB of loss. And then we go on up into some of the other cables, the loss is even less. The larger cables have less loss, and, uh, but in all cases, as the frequency increases, regardless of the type of the cable, as the frequency increases, the loss increases. And when you're buying cable, that's one of the things that you need to consider and to keep your cable runs as, as short as you possibly can. In what values are RF feed line losses usually expressed? They're expressed in decibels per 100 feet. Decibels per 100 feet. What must be done to prevent standing waves on an antenna feed line? The antenna feed point impedance must be matched to the character impe characteristic impedance of the feed line. And we saw that with the, uh, the little animation back there and then the, the uh, analogy of the flashlight being reflected by the window. If the SWR on an antenna feed line is 5 to 1, and a matching network at the transmitter end of the feed line is adjusted to 1 to 1 SWR, what's the resulting SWR on the feed line? Okay, now this may give you some, some pause here, because we talk about an, uh, matching networks or antenna tuners being used to, uh, to match an antenna. Okay? If the SWR on the antenna feed line is 5 to 1, and you put a matching network at the transmitter, and adjust that to 1 to 1, what's the resulting SWR on the feed line? It's 5 to 1. The SWR on the feed line does not change. All we do is change the impedance that the transmitter sees with the impedance matching network here just before the transmitter. Okay? So we have SWR of 1 to 1. The transmitter's happy. The, uh, the reflected power, the standing wave ratio of the reflected power, on the, uh, the, on the feed line is still high. It hasn't changed at all. Now how could we get something like that? A 50 ohm feed line feeding a 10 ohm antenna would give us exactly that, an SWR of 5 to 1. So your antenna tuner at the transmitter does not change the SWR on the feed line. What standing wave ratio will result from the connection of a, a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having a 200 ohm impedance, uh, we saw that already. We saw that with the um, the animation. We had a, a 50 ohm feed line, a 200 ohm antenna impedance that gave us a four to one uh, standing wave ratio. Now, why isn't it one to four? The reason is that we always state the standing wave ratio with the larger number first. Okay. Always state it with the larger number first. What standing wave ratio will result from the connection of a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having a 10 ohm impedance? Okay, uh, the ratio between the impedances is five, isn't it? So our standing wave ratio will be five to one. Always the larger number before the smaller one. What standing wave ratio will result from the connection of a 50 ohm feed line to a non-reactive load having a 50 ohm impedance? That will be one to one. One to one. Now, you might ask, why isn't it 50 to 50? Because, well, that's where you start, but it's just like a fraction. You reduce it down until you have a 1 in this position. 
What would be the SWR if you feed a vertical antenna that has a 25 ohm feed point impedance with 50 ohm coaxial cable? The ratio here is 2 to 1, isn't it? So it will be a SWR of 2 to 1. What would be the SWR if you feed an antenna that has a 300 ohm feed point impedance with a 50 ohm coaxial cable? This is six times this, so the SWR will be six to one. 